Welcome to this conversation with B'nai B'rith International and Happy New Year to all. I'm CEO Dan Mariash and we appreciate your spending some time with us today. In May 1945, Germany surrendered to the Allied powers, putting an end to World War II in Europe. But the Nazis' downfall meant upward of six million people stranded in defeated Germany after the war. The Allies repatriated the majority of these individuals over a period of months, but by late 1945, more than one million remained unwilling or unable to return home, including hundreds of thousands of Jewish concentration camp survivors. The stories of these displaced persons are often left out of textbooks and frequently appear only as footnotes of history. But with us today is author, biographer, and historian, Dr. David Nassau, whose insightful new book, The Last Million, Europe's Displaced Persons from World War to Cold War, explores the stories of the nearly 250,000 Jewish men, women, and children, among others, who remained trapped in Germany after the Holocaust ended. An acclaimed historian and author of best-selling books on William Randolph Hearst, Andrew Carnegie, and Joseph P. Kennedy, Dr. Nassau was most recently the Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. Professor of History at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He's widely considered to be an expert on the history of popular entertainment and the news media in the US and the UK. I'll be speaking with Dr. Nassau about his book, The Last Million, which details the Jewish refugees left behind in post-war Germany and the complex social and political factors that prevented them from finding new homes. Dr. Nassau, we really appreciate uh, your taking the time to be with us today. My pleasure. Well, I'd like to start, if I can, with uh, some dialogue from Schindler's List. So in the, the third from the last scene in the movie, um, a, a Soviet officer appears. Uh, this is uh, the morning after Schindler leaves uh, Brunlitz. And he says to those of the Schindler um, group, uh, he says, you've been liberated by the Soviet army. And then Itzhak Stern says, have you been in Poland? He asks the officer. And the officer says, I just came from Poland. And Stern asks, are there any Jews left? And then Michael Lemper asks, where should we go? And the key line here, the officer says, don't go east, that's for sure, they hate you there. I wouldn't go west either if I was you. So with that, help us set the stage with regard to the refugees who were displaced in post-World War II Europe. Uh, documentation suggests that uh, preparations for the millions of, of displaced persons may have begun earlier, perhaps during the war itself. Who knows, you'll, you'll tell us. According to your research, did the Allies plan ahead to make accommodations for those who, who would be displaced? And if so, did any of these preparations pan out? Did they really work? Well, thank you. Uh, it's a lot of wonderful questions and a terrific lead in from, from Schindler's List. In 1943, Franklin Roosevelt, who was prescient in this as, as in so many other areas, understood that when the war was over in Europe, there would be millions of homeless, stateless, displaced persons. And he called together the leaders of the nations of the world that were fighting the war or that were allied with the Soviets or with the Americans or the British. And they set up a United Nations institution, the United Nations Refugee and Rehabilitation Administration. This was before there was a United Nations organization. And its task was going to be to rebuild Germany and to take care of the displaced persons and take care of them by repatriating them, by feeding them, giving them medical care, and as soon as they were able, send them home. That was the plan. The Americans signed off on it, the British, Soviets, everybody else. Well, when the war was over, there were a million refugees who refused to go home. The Jews had no homes to return to. 
the Poles, non-Jewish Poles, were afraid. They didn't know what to expect in a Poland that had been devastated by war and then fallen within the Soviet bloc. The Latvians, the Lithuanians, and the Estonians, non-Jewish Baltics, had come to Germany, a large number of them, because they had collaborated with the Nazis in big ways and small ways. And they refused to go home because they didn't want to face what they believed would be punishment for their collaboration with the Nazis. Some of them, some Lithuanian, non-Jewish Lithuanians, Latvians and Estonians didn't want to go back because like the Poles, they didn't know what to expect or they did know what to expect from a Soviet dominated nation. The smallest number in the beginning when the camps were liberated of the people left behind in, in Germany were the Jews. There were 20, 30, 40,000 Jews who were liberated from Dachau, from Bergen-Belsen, from the concentration and death camps in Germany. And how had they gotten there? At the end of the war, the Germans realize that the Red Army is gonna take over Poland. And the Red Army is going to liberate Auschwitz in Bergenau. The last thing the Germans want is for the world to know what they've done to the Jews. So what do they do? They make a decision. It makes more sense rather than gas the Jews, including hundreds of thousands of Hungarians who had recently been sent to Auschwitz to be gassed to death. Instead of gassing them to death, they would bring them into Germany, put them in the underground armaments factories and work them to death. And they did. When the war was over, the allies found 20 to 30 starving, typhus ridden Jews who they liberated and who became part of the last million. That number of 20 to 30,000 was multiplied 10 times over in 1946 because the 80 to 90% of the Polish Jews who survived the war survived it because they escaped the Nazis and escaped the Nazi Holocaust by crossing the border and being put to work by the Soviets in the Asiatic reaches of the Soviet Union. When the war was over, 200,000 to 250,000 Polish Jews came back to Poland, hoping to renew their lives there. And they discovered that the Poles had taken their property, had taken their homes, their businesses, their farms, their apartments. And when they returned to their former homes after being away, the Poles said, we don't want you. Why aren't you dead? We thought you were dead. And there was violence, there were pogroms, and the Jews who returned to the Soviet Union, the vast majority, in 1946, escaped Polish terror by crossing the borders and ending up, this is the irony of ironies, in Germany. And they went into the displaced persons camps where they would spend the next two to three to four years. Let's go back, uh, to, it's mid-1945. Uh, the Germans and the Axis powers have surrendered. Uh, there is this, this group of six million refugees. How long did it take and how, was it, how did it happen that, that so many of, of the six million were able to, to leave or be repatriated so quickly because it seems like it was an, over a matter of months. How did, how did that yeah. happen? It, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And the, and the allied occupying armies um, had a lot to do with it. Uh, there were hundreds of thousands of millions of Western European prisoners of war 
that had been put to work in Germany. They walked home, took trucks, trains, planes, back to Belgium, the Netherlands, France, England, the Soviet prisoners of war and forced laborers went home as quickly as they could. The Germans conscripted they millions of Ukrainians and Poles and Yugoslavians and Eastern Europeans to work in the farms and the factories to take the place of the German soldiers who were fighting on the Eastern Front. And when the war was over, they, the Eastern Europeans, the Italians, and some of the Russians, the Belarusians, they went home as quickly as they could. Uh, the Allies helped every step of the way. They used all of the equipment they had used to ferry American and British troops into Germany to take the displaced persons out to bring them home again. Uh, and they did. And the Allies were delighted that they had accomplished this. And the Soviets were delighted that they had repatriated millions of prisoners of war and forced laborers. But a last, so, but a million right. remained. So by let's talk about the 250,000. Now we're talking about mid 1946, perhaps the beginning of 1947. Um, why did it take so long? And this is very important. This is an important part of the book and the message of your book. Why did it take so long for Jewish survivors to be resettled across the globe? I mean, we've talked now about these millions of, of those who were repatriated yeah. here and there, yeah. but why did it take so long? Let's let's go back to you, your, your Schindler's List quotations. It took so long because no one in the world wanted the Jews. By 1947, the countries of the world, especially of Western Europe, and Australia and Canada realized that they needed more laborers. They needed more farmers. They needed more loggers. They needed more factory workers. And an easy place to get them was in the displaced persons camp. So they sent recruiting parties into the camps to interview the displaced persons. And they jumped at the chance to resettle Latvians and Lithuanians and Poles and Yugoslavs in Argentina, in Canada, in Australia, in England. But nobody wanted the Jews. And they didn't want the Jews for two reasons. One is traditional anti-Semitism. They regarded the Jews as clannish, as bookish, as unable to do manual labor. All of you, you know, we, we know all these myths about the Jews that are the standard, the, the core of anti-Semitism. But there was a new element um, because the Jews had spent the war in the Soviet Union or because the vast majority of them were Polish and Polish was now communist. They, the, a new myth was created. And that myth was that all Jews were Bolsheviks. All Jews were Bolsheviks. This myth had been around since the Russian Revolution. It had been spread by the Pope. Nazis had picked up on it, fascists, anti-Semites. But now in the post-war period, the nations of the world and a vast number of American senators, congressmen, politicians said, we can't allow the Holocaust survivors into our country. Why? Because they might be spies, because they probably are spies, because we're in a cold war now and we, we can't afford it. If I can just bring this up to date, historians usually don't like to jump from 1945 to 2020. Um, two weeks ago, Senator Cruz of Texas voiced his opposition to a bill that had bipartisan support for bringing in Hong Kong democracy activists to the United States. 
There was a bipartisan bill because they were going to be imprisoned by the Chinese. And Ted Cruz said, we can't bring them into this country. Why? Because they might be Chinese spies. That was nonsense. And it was nonsense to say that we couldn't bring the Jews in to this country in 1947, 1948, 1949, because they might be communist spies. So while they're waiting, and we'll get to that in a second, to, to finish how, how this was all resolved, uh, while they're waiting, how are they treated in these camps? How are the Jews treated? In these? They've just gone through the most unimaginable barbarity. Uh, and now it's known. Now it's known to the world. This is not, uh, people can't say I didn't know. There's uh, Eisenhower's famous, famous quote, certainly a lot of, of documentary footage, newsreel footage. I mean, everybody now is beginning to understand what happened. So now the Jews are, are, are stuck in, in the place which created this, this uh, uh, abhorrent 12-year period for the Jewish people. How were they treated in the camps? If this were a science fiction fantasy, no one would believe it. Um, but it wasn't science fiction, it was real. The Jews were not recognized as a separate people in the beginning. Polish Jews were considered to be Poles. The handful of surviving Lithuanian Jews were considered to be Lithuanians. So when they were brought out of the concentration camps and the death camps and the work camps, the Polish Jews were sent to large assembly halls and large displaced persons camps with non-Jewish Poles, some of whom had been the kapos in the camps. Some of them had, in Poland, taken away their family's property. In Lithuania, some of the Lithuanian Jews found themselves in displaced persons camps with the guards that had lorded it over them at Auschwitz and Birkenau. It was not until July, two months after liberation, that Truman sent a special emissary to investigate what was going on with the Jews. And he did it because Morgenthau was the, Robert Morgenthau, the only Jewish member of the cabinet said there's something wrong. The Jews are being mistreated. So Truman chose a Quaker lawyer by the name of Earl Harrison, sent him to investigate the condition of the Jews. Harrison came back, went to the White House, delivered his report in person. And in his report, it said, we are treating the Jews as badly as the Germans did, except we're not exterminating them. We're just holding them in these camps where they are tortured again. They need to have their own camps. They need to get extra rations. They need Yiddish speakers there. They need to practice their religion. Um, and Truman, instead of simply disregarding this, uh, was infuriated. And he wrote directly to Eisenhower and he said, take care of this. Take care of the Jews. They are not just another group of survivors. They have, their suffering has been unique. And Eisenhower, you know, God bless him, visited the camps. He attended Yom Kippur services at one of the displaced persons camps. And he instructed his generals, the leaders of the occupying army to immediately immediately set up separate camps for the Jews, remove all the German guards and the American guards, let the Jews take care of themselves in these camps. And he gave them extra rations, extra blankets, extra medical care. Uh, and, and he saved them. Uh, How did that uh, play itself out in terms of, of others? Once, once the separate camps were established, um, presumably, you know, the, their religious needs were taken care of. I assume there were rabbis. I, I'm guessing the Jewish Welfare Board probably uh, assigned rabbis to uh, to be there. But what in, in the in the 1947 way of of 
looking at this kind of issue at rehabilitation, let's say, I mean, what would there be the equivalent of, of counselors? Would there be the equivalent of, of educators, teachers, uh, while, while these folks are, are there um, to, to kind of get them back on their feet? Yeah, it took time, it took time. But by the fall of 1945, the American Jewish organizations and the British Jewish organizations were sending uh, millions of dollars worth of food, supplies, medical instruments, doctors, nurses into the camps. And the Jewish agency in Palestine was sending teachers, counselors to prepare the Jewish survivors for what everyone hoped would be Aliyah to Palestine, to a Jewish homeland. Uh, the Jews in the camps, they called themselves the surviving remnant. Uh, and they recognized very early on that mourning was a necessity, but not sufficient. They couldn't spend their lives mourning the dead. They had to resurrect from the ashes of the Holocaust, a Jewish community, a Jewish culture, a Jewish religion. And they went to work doing that. The vast majority of the Jews in the camps were Zionists. And they were Zionists of necessity because they recognized quickly that they would not be able to emigrate to the United States or Canada or Australia where they might have had relatives and where they knew they would e lead easier lives than in Palestine, which was on the brink of civil war between the Jews and the Arabs. Um, but the only place where they knew they would be comfortable, the only nation on earth which wanted them was the Jews agency and the Jews in, in Palestine. So they became Zionists. Truman, from the very beginning, said to Churchill and then Clement Attlee, who was the prime minister, take the Jews. Let me, let me ask you about that, because this is, um, we're talking about the situation in, in pre-state Palestine. Yes. Um, you know, we, we know that British policy toward Jews, refugees, uh, potential refugees, uh, both before and after the war, was discriminatory towards Jews because the, this is this is the story. This is what Britain did. It uh, came into this the mandate and uh, then made life difficult for Jews as the storm clouds of war and Holocaust uh, gathered. So I'm curious. You know, when you mentioned Attlee and, and Churchill. Were there any uh, British political, political figures or NGOs who fought for the rights of Jewish refugees to, to leave Europe and, and to get to, uh, into a pre-state Palestine? Yes, yes, they were, but, but they were vastly outnumbered. Most of them happened to be in the Labor Party. They had voted when out of power to do everything they could to establish a Jewish homeland. Uh, once they were in power, Atlee and his foreign minister, Ernest Bevan, who was a frightening anti-Semite, they did everything they could. And, and for me, one of the most distressing parts of doing the research for this book was reading the records of the British Foreign Office in which over and over and over again, those in charge of the occupation in Germany and those in charge of Palestine said, why are these Jews complaining? Lots of people were damaged. Lots of people were injured. Why are we giving them any, why should they get any special treatment? Um, Truman said to Attlee, and he had said to Churchill before that, he said, you don't have to worry anymore about the European Jews overwhelming the Middle East. Six million of them are dead. We're talking about 100,000. And he begged, pleaded, used 
whatever pressure he thought he had to get the British to open the gates of Palestine to 100,000 Jewish refugees. And the British said no. And they said no again and again and again and again. When the Polish Jews tried to get back into Germany because they were not safe in Poland, the British closed their borders. The, the British zone of occupation was closed to the Polish Jews. And that's why they all ended up in the American zone of occupation. The, the British record was, I'm a historian, so I knew some of this, but was infinitely worse than I ever believed. And the British Jewish community, like the American Jewish community, was afraid to speak out, to use their political clout, was afraid to stand strong and to say something must be done to rescue the Jews. They are not simply survivors of war. They are survivors of the Holocaust. Their suffering is unique. It is the responsibility of the world to welcome them, to provide them with access to resettlement in Palestine if they so choose or in Argentina or Canada or the United States. But the American Jewish community was, was afraid to use its clout because they thought anti-Semitism in the United States and in Britain was so strong that the more they spoke out for the displaced persons, the displaced Jews, the worse it would be for homegrown anti-Semitism. Let me go back uh, to the, um the tormentors who drifted into these camps, the, the, those who were collaborators of the Nazis, those who were part of, of the, uh, the, the, the Nazi uh, machine uh, from the Baltics, but not only from the Baltics. So they make their way into these camps and ultimately they make their way west. Um, would you comment on, on that? Because you know, even even today, after all of these years, you know, there still are there still are some. I mean, the Office of Special Investigations was set up yeah. to to deal with these cases, and we we discovered, and really, so much credit goes uh, to that office, which which has uh, pursued uh, these uh, individuals who came in. Uh, tell us a little about that. How did it happen? How was there There's so much? Uh, 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 facility in, in kind of moving these, these people along. I gather they weren't only coming into the United States, they were also probably going uh, to, to places like the UK and, and other places. But tell us about that. It, it, you know, the, the World War merged into Cold War almost immediately. And by 1946, by 1947, the enemy was the Soviet Union and Stalin. Um, those who had fought against the Soviets in German uniforms were now our allies because they were anti-communist. We forgot and we forgave the tormentors of the Jews, the torturers of the Jews, the Nazi collaborators from Latvia and Ukraine and Lithuania. We forgot what they had done or we overlooked it. You know, th there's this frightening story. I, I can tell many of them, they're all in the book. Um, the, the English, the British decided that they need miners. They need miners to work in the mines as a labor shortage. So they bring into England a large number of Latvians who are gonna work in the mines. The Latvians go to work in the mines and before and after they go to work, they change their clothes. And the British miners look and they see Waffen SS tattoos on the arms of the Latvian displaced persons who the British have resettled. And the miners go on strike. So what does the British government do? It issues a mandate that from now on, if we take in people with Waffen SS tattoos from Lithuania or Ukraine, we got to put them to work in places where they'll 
never take off their shirts. I mean, this is, this is unbelievable. In the United States, there is virtually no scrutiny in 1948, 1949, 1950 of ex-Nazis. It is hard as hell for Jewish displaced persons to get into this country, especially if that Jewish displaced persons had any connection with the Soviet Union. But for the Nazi collaborators who were now visibly anti-communist, you know, the doors were open. Not only were the doors open, but the CIA, you know, the army, the Air Force, um, sought them out. It's not just Werner von Braun who we bring to this country. We bring to this country lots of Nazi collaborators to work on Radio Free Europe, to go on lecture tours, to explain to the American people that you've got to be ready to fight World War III. The Americans don't want to fight World War III. They don't want to fight the Soviets. Um, but there are many in government who believe that the Americans have to be ready for that eventuality. And what better group to bring the message than these war criminals, these collaborators? Let's talk uh, specifically about your archival research. Out of the, the numerous stories that you uncovered um, concerning life in the camps, um, what are the, some of the most memorable um, things that you uncovered in all of this? Okay. You know, thank God for Steven Spielberg and the, the Shoah Foundation. The Shoah Foundation, and I encourage people to take a look at some of these testimonies. Um, they're, they're online, they're easily accessible, it's the Shoah Foundation. And there are testimonies from tens of thousands of um, Holocaust survivors. And they talk about their experience, not only during the war, but after the war. Um, I met one family. Most of my displaced persons were, were dead. I talked to a lot of their children. And at some point during my research, I went to see Itzhak and Lola Lachman, who were in a old age home, a nursing home in, in Queens. And Itzhak and Lola were from Poland. They had met when they were teenagers briefly. And then they met again at Dachau. And then they met again at Landsberg, the displaced persons camp. And they had been through hell at any number of camps. And they met in Landsberg and I interviewed Itzhak, who was 98 at the time, his wife was 96. And he spoke to me with tears in his eyes about what had gone on. And then he spoke to me about his cousins, his American Jewish cousins, who, because a army chaplain put a notice in the forwards and his cousins read the forwards. They knew that Itzhak was alive and they contacted the chaplain. And as soon as it was possible, they brought Itzhak and Lola and their son who was born in the camps to the United States. And they found him a home and they found Itzhak work. And for, for Itzhak, for this, you know, th this man who is recounting his, his life story to me, the kindness of the American Jewish community and his cousins outweighed the evil, uh, the hell that he had gone through. He looked at me at one point at the end of this interview and he said, it's a good life. I've been married for 70 years to Lola. It, it's a good life. The resilience of these people, of the survivors, um, who I interviewed, who I talked to, their, their children, whose oral histories I read, is, is just extraordinary. How long, uh, just to wrap up here, how long were the, the camps open in Germany? Um, and when, when did this begin to wind down and, and when were they closed? Now, these camps, if, if I recall correctly, um, they were located mainly in around around Munich. Is that more or less where yeah. they were? 
the southern yeah, part of, of Germany. Yeah, mo most of them, most of them. The camps beginning in 1947, in 1948, movement out of the camps begins. The non-Jews are welcomed and resettled all over the world. Canada, Australia, South America, every place except the United States. Uh, the Jews have to leave illegally. And they leave with the help of Mossad, and with the help of the Jewish agency, and with the help of the American Jewish community. They go on what they call Ali Abet, or the illegal immigration, to Palestine. The exodus is part of this. But it's really not until Israeli independence is declared in 1948 and quickly affirmed by Rosa, by um, Truman that the Jews can leave. The Israelis welcome every displaced Jew. They set up hospitals and sanitaria for those who were too ill to enter uh, normal life. Still, there are camps with some Polish survivors and some Jews, including Orthodox, who don't want to go to Israel, um, who remain in Germany into the middle 50s. Uh, again, a, a second irony, um, the displaced persons go to Israel and where are they resettled? They are resettled in homes, apartments that have been abandoned for one reason or another by the Palestinians in the 1948 war. And the irony here is that one displaced person's problem is solved only because another group of people have been displaced during a war. The, the Jews are put into settlements and into homes that had once housed uh, Palestinians. It's not their fault, not their fault. It is an irony of history that this is the way that the Jewish displaced persons problem was solved. Truman uh, recognized the state of Israel, not for all the reasons we learn in our textbooks, because he had Jewish friends and he read the Bible and he was a humanitarian. That's all true. But he also did it because no place on earth was willing to take the Jews and they could not remain indefinitely in camps in Germany. So when Israeli independence was declared and a home land was opened up for the Jews, Truman jumped on it and immediately recognized the new state of Israel. Yeah, I know it's, uh, you know, we have right now, of course, the ongoing discussion about the 800,000 Jews who uh, fled, forced to leave um, from Arab countries yeah. uh, in a very short period of time, let's say between 1948 and 1960. Uh, and that is an ongoing issue that has uh, yet to be fully recognized. Uh, now, of course, almost all of these people were, as, as the Jews from Germany, almost all of these people were absorbed uh, by Israel. There, there was a debate that went on in Israel because some of the uh, cabinet, Ben-Gurion's cabinet said, we, we just can't, we're, we're at war with the Arabs. We're a new state. We don't have the resources. We can't take in the displaced persons. And Ben Gurion and Golda Meir and Katz Nelson and the majority in the Jewish agency and then in the new Jewish state said, no, no, it is our responsibility to find places for them to take them in whether they can serve in the army, whether they can help in the war, or whether they cannot, we have to take in these people. They are Jews, and they must be part of the new state of Israel. And, you know, they were welcomed. 
to their eternal credit. Well, the book is The Last Million, Europe's Displaced Persons from World War to Cold War by Dr. David Nassau and is available online wherever you purchase books. Dr. Nassau, thank you so much for your tireless work shedding light on the oft forgotten refugees left behind in Germany after World War II and for speaking with us today. It's been my pleasure. It's been a great interview. Thank you. Well, our thanks to Dr. David Nassau for joining me today to discuss the fate of Jewish refugees after World War II and his book, The Last Million. And thank you for tuning in to this conversation with B'nai Brif. If you enjoyed this discussion, make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel, liking us on Facebook, and following us on Twitter. And be sure to visit our website, b'nai to learn more about our important work. See you again soon, everyone. Take care.